So welcome. I want to thank everyone for joining us for tonight's keynote. We currently have roughly 1,500 people who have joined us for tonight's, tonight's session. My guess is very few of you know who I am, so let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Chris Oliviero. Um, I'm the general manager for Nyman Ranch, and I had the privilege of joining this team about two years ago. And I'm honored to be here tonight to introduce Dr. Temple Grandin, um, someone I am proud to share has been an advisor and a friend of Nyman Ranch for many years. You know, my history with Dr. Grandin started uh, much more recently, and it's kind of a funny story. Um, you know, I, I didn't meet uh, Dr. Grandin on a farm in one of her classrooms. I, I didn't meet her um, at a conference. You know, instead I was, um, I was at Denver International Airport, and I was boarding a, a shuttle from the economy parking lot. And I put my bag down. I sat down, and when I looked up, sitting directly across from me was, was Dr. Grandin, and I immediately recognized her. And I was actually flying to Des Moines for this very event uh, a year ago, and I had on a shirt, probably this shirt, with a Nyman Ranch logo, and, and she looked at me, and then she pointed at the logo, and she said, you work for Nyman Ranch. I don't know who you are. Who are you? And, you know, and so And so I... You know, I, I, I looked at her and I said, you know, my name's Chris Olivier. I'm the, I'm the general manager for Nyman Ranch. And we, we rode the, uh, the shuttle to the terminal together and then had, a, had a, just a fascinating conversation, you know, walking through the airport and, you know, got on our separate flights and, and uh, went our separate ways. And I can assure you, you know, I'm telling you this story not for anything to do with me and it has nothing to do with my shirt. Um, you know, the the reason I'm telling this story is, is Temple knows just about everybody at Nyman Ranch. And when she saw a new face with a Nyman Ranch logo, you know, she, she made a point of asking who I was and, and what it is that I do. You know, she didn't have to do that. Uh, you know, she had places to go and, and things to do. Um, but the reason Nyman did, or that, that Temple did this is because she played an incredibly important role in helping to craft uh, Nyman Ranch's animal welfare protocols. You know, and these are publicly available. They always have been. Nyman's very transparent. You can see them for yourselves if you go to our go to our website. Um, you know, but but her her purpose was to make sure that when we say raised with care, that we mean it, and that there was some meaning behind that. Um, and and you know, just a really important role. Um, and so one bit of housekeeping. So if you have questions throughout today's panel, please leave them in the chat. Um, we will save 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, I'm sure there will be more questions than we can get through, uh, but we'll do our best uh, with the time that we have. So, you know, it's my great honor to be here tonight um, for this keynote event, which is part of Nyman Ranch's 22nd annual hog farmer appreciation celebration. You know, and the 22nd year looks a lot different from the last 21 years, uh, as just about everything does today. Um, you know, the event is usually held in person with hundreds of farmers getting together with customers, partners, thought leaders, advocates, um, and friends. And, you know, instead, this year, we've held 13 virtual events. Um, so far, we have one more tomorrow, which is a virtual um, farm tour. And we'll be, we'll be uh, walking through four individual Nyman Ranch farms. If you want to join, please do. We'd love to have you. Um, you know, this hog farmer appreciation event is just one more example of how 2020 um, has been a strange and challenging year, not just for us, but for everybody. So why is the keynote tonight so important? You know, I think if anybody's been paying attention to the press, the media, you know, over the last couple of years, farmers and the agriculture sector have been hit especially hard um, by a series of events beginning with trade wars, Two winters ago was a brutally cold winter, and then we had the floods throughout the Midwest. And then this past winter, of course, we had COVID. Um, you know, supply chains have been tested. You know, many have failed, and I can tell you many supply chains today are struggling. Um, you know, if you went to a grocery store in April or even May, chances are you found empty shelves. You might have found a couple of people uh, fighting over a, a package of, of meat that, you know, in, in different times they never would have picked up. You might have seen them bickering over the last roll of toilet paper. Truly chaotic times and not the sort of thing that any of us were accustomed to seeing here in the U.S. 
Um, if you were watching the media, you couldn't help but, see, but hear reports of meat plants um, shutting down due to staff shortages and in some case, cases due to illnesses. You know, and this put farmers in, a, in an incredibly difficult position. Many farmers were left. We've taken every single hog that we, that we committed to and more. We've paid our farmers um, every penny that we promised the moment those, those piglets were born. Um, and in fact, we've added many new farmers over the course of the past six months um, to fill increased demand uh, for humanely raised meat from brand people trust. You know, what's been fascinating about COVID is where it's a health issue. People are paying more and more attention to what they put into their bodies. You know, bottom line is we have more interest from farmers than ever before to join our community. We have 70 plus uh, farmers that we're currently in the process of bringing on board. And since last September, we brought 75 farmers on. Um, you know, word is spread that we pay a premium and we have strict protocols. And I can assure you raising hogs for Nyman Ranch is not easy. You know, it's one thing to go to one of our farms in, you know, April or, you know, the middle of summer or, you know, early fall. All of our hogs are raised outside. If you wanna know what it's like to raise hogs for Nyman Ranch and the strict protocols go in January. Um, that's a very different, um, you know, scenario than most people think of. Um, you know, bottom line is we provide stability and we stand by our word and farmers know that we have a, a, a uh, reputation for resiliency. To have a resilient system, you have to do well financially. There's no way around that. If you aren't financially secure, you are at risk. And what I want to spend a minute walking you through right now is just a, a quick chart. And this chart is comparing what Nyman Ranch pays versus commodity. And if you'll notice in the bottom, there's two points I wanna make. The, the section in orange, that is the commodity pay. That's publicly available information. And it's on a per hundred weight basis to make it easy, just double it. And that tells you what commodity farmers were paid per animal. And I think what you'll notice over the past five years is the peaks have gotten fewer, the gaps between them have grown longer and the valleys have gotten, have gotten deeper. And if you look at the period from January of this year through August, that's been just a truly unique and very challenging time um, to be a commodity uh, in the commodity hog farming business. You know, up top, the blue line, that's the Nyman Ranch model. That's, that's our pay scale. And you'll notice it's very stable, it's very consistent. And, and that's by design. We have a floor in terms of what we pay farmers. Um, and we pay a premium above commodity. And interesting to note, between January and August of this year, Nyman Ranch paid an average of $104 more per animal than commodity. And if you look at the valley in June, that gap was $134 at the, at the, very, at the peak of COVID and, and the worst time for the commodity industry. And I say this just to emphasize you know, what we provide. We provide stability and we provide a premium. And I wanna share this because as we go into Dr. Grandin's remarks, you know, the Nyman Ranch model is a great example of a much less efficient model. Much smaller farms, much slower systems, but it's proved to be much more resilient during one of the most challenging periods in agriculture. So while this lesson was dawning on me, as I lived, ev lived it every day, it be became crystal clear when I read um, a piece in Forbes by Dr. Temple Grandin titled uh, Big Meat Supply Chains Are Fragile. And, and the main point in this, and I'm just going to read a quick quote, is big is not bad, it is fragile. And the bottom line is, to quote Dr. Grandin, the bottom line is there will always be a trade-off. Big suppliers are low cost, efficient, and fragile. More numerous local, local producers are more expensive but the entire supply is more robust. It will be less prone to disruption from floods, fires, electric power failures, storms or diseases like coronavirus or others in the future. So, you know, I think that's a great way to segue over into to, uh, Dr. Grandin's remarks. I'm honored to introduce her, to share her remarks on this topic and her wisdom on how we might chart a more resilient path forward for livestock and farmers alike. Well, it's really great to be here to talk to everybody by video tonight. 
And uh, about five years ago, I was teaching my class in livestock handling. And people always say, you know, big is bad. And as I turned around to write something on the whiteboard, I thought, big is not bad, it's fragile. And then shortly after that, we had some big floods here. The interstate got flooded. I remember trying to get back home from the uh, Denver airport. Normally, you just go up by 25, but everything was flooded. I ended up going all the way to Greeley. I went around the big Cooner feed yard. There was a bridge that had about this much left in it before it was going to get flooded. I went over that, and I got really got thinking, big is fragile. And then we had the Tyson fire. And it took a long time to fix it because a fire in the box storage room damaged the pre-stressed concrete roof, which is difficult and expensive to fix. And that's another example of big is, uh, is fragile. And then the worst thing, which Chris has already talked about, was all the pigs that had to be killed in the Midwest due to, uh, due to COVID because the plant was now operating at half capacity. And there were some things that could have been done. I'm gonna be talking a little bit, just a little bit later about some of the stuff that you can do to make even a big supply chain more um, resilient. But just in the last month, I've been reading more and more things. I've gotten contacted by some people wanting to build more local plants. And what I can see happening with the big plants and with the smaller suppliers, it's gonna be kind of like the Fort Collins beer industry. We have all kinds of small breweries living in the shadow of Budweiser and they coexist. There's a place for both. The trade-off was already discussed. Now, what are some of the other industries also have big is fragile? Let's look at pharmaceuticals. That's even scarier. One or two plants in China make the raw materials. A couple of factories in India make the pills for common antibiotics. I just know a guy that I've worked with, a really nice guy I worked with, got an infected foot. Well, he would not be alive without antibiotics. You know, those are very essential medications. Now, I just read this article today in the Wall Street Journal. You can see a picture of an oil refinery on there. And it says, here comes a refinery glut. Well, we've got all kinds of oil because people aren't driving. And that's a refinery in Germany. And they're trying to decide what to do with it. A smaller refinery. Now, if you shut it down, then you're going to get into the issue of the biggest fragile. What if that pipeline coming in from somewhere else stops working? You're going to be in a whole lot of trouble. So they were discussing what to do with this. Maybe they'll store fuel in it. That at least would make people take care of it. But as I looked at that picture today in the Wall Street Journal, if I was um, you know, running things in Germany, I would not want to destroy that refinery because it may need it one of these days. Because there's other supplies with trade wars and everything, things are not so good. So what could you do to help make things more robust? Now, of course, Nyman Ranch, it's a very robust distributed supply chain. But where the problem was the worst with having to kill pigs on the farm, and this was awful. And some of the methods used were definitely not euthanasia. And there were people that got PTSD over it. It was beyond terrible. And they tried to slow pigs down. Now, fortunately, they didn't have to kill any cattle. And there were some chickens that had to be killed. But one of the things you could do with half a crew in a meat packing plant is just cut the pigs up into the big primal cuts. I call it big pig bits. Just cut that carcass up in the hams and shoulders and loins and bellies and just throw it in combos. I know places I could take that truck and sell it off the back of the truck. Big pig bits. And actually, on the East Coast, Smithfield was selling pig carcasses to China. So they didn't have to destroy so many pigs on the farm. But this is the kind of thing that has to be figured out up front. The other issue on the other end of the supply chain was worse. Tankers of milk thrown away because a school lunch milk had the wrong package to sell it at the grocery store. You're throwing milk away for a reason for that, that stupid. Milk's milk. Now I can understand some foods, they'd be concerns about labeling for allergies, but milk is milk and pork is pork. You know, we need to be getting those kind of things figured out. Lettuce that was just thrown away, tomatoes thrown away, just absolutely just disgusting, totally horrible wasting of food. So what you have to do up front is figure out what do you do if something breaks on the live end and then on the distribution end. Okay, then there's the power grid. 
I'm going to tell you right now, I know some things about the power grid. NASA has a very, uh, has a very special thing. It's called unclassified but sensitive. I know some things about the power grid. I'm not going to tell you tonight because I lay awake at night about it. Big. It's very, very fragile. And I think people are getting more interested in local. People got scared seeing shelves stripped. There's a video online of a fist fight in Australia over toilet paper. I no. We are, I think people are going to be really thinking about supply chains for lots of different things. And I got a really short talk because what I really want to do is I want to open it up to the questions because that's the real interesting part. And maybe before we do that, I can talk a little bit about guidelines. What I worked on years ago with Nyman, and I worked on that with a lot of other companies, guidelines have to be clear. You can't just say we care for pigs. You can't just say handle them properly. One person's idea of proper would be somebody else's idea of bad. You have to have clear guidelines for things like lameness. You can measure that. Body condition, I can measure that. You have requirements for certain types of housing. You've got to make sure they actually have it. it it's got to be clear. And so that what you're saying on your label, you actually are doing what you do. Well, maybe somebody's going to have some questions in here by now. Because I think online is a lot more interesting with questions than hearing lectures. That's what's called the flipped classroom concept. And I've been doing that with my course. I got recorded lectures online and then on Zoom we got discussion. So nobody's got any discussion? Nope, nobody's writing anything in the chat? Well, uh, Temple, we did have one question just on Nyman. Uh, they asked the question, did we have to euthanize pigs? And, and so I, I wanna just answer that one directly. And, and the answer is no. Um, and we, we took every pig and more. Um, we took them on schedule. Um, and, you know, we're very fortunate um, in terms of the network of farmers that we have and the model that we have in place where uh, we didn't experience any pressure on that front. Well, that's really good. And cattle are easier to hold. And um, you can put them on hay. And I don't, to my knowledge, I don't think any cattle had to be destroyed. Chickens, they had to destroy some, but that's a shorter cycle. But this was a really hard lesson. And big is fragile, extremely fragile. And uh, distributed supply chains are more expensive, but they're a lot harder to break because you've got more sources of supply. When I first started out in the beef industry, you know, we had maybe a third of our supply for maybe Denver and for Phoenix, Arizona was in what they call a medium sized plant. Might do, you know, 400 cattle a day. You know, that's no longer the case, but now there's several states getting interested now in building those kind of plants and they can't compete directly with the, you know, the big commodity plants. They've got to do something special. And one of those special things is local. And I think people now really deep down inside are now going, what happens if that truck or Walmart or whatever doesn't come? Well, there'll be empty shelves and there'll be a whole bunch of them. And the storms too are crazy. Here in Fort Collins, uh, we went from 100 degrees, 95 degrees hot down to snow and below freezing in one day. It was the biggest temperature shift in over a hundred years. And then we've had the fires. That really, uh, it went almost a night in the middle of the day due to the soot and the skies were red. Absolutely. That was really crazy. That happened right here. Oh, I, I felt it, Temple. Hey, so Temple, we, we had a question, a few questions come in. So one of them, and I think this is a great one, is what can the average person do to support the concept of a resilient food supply? One of the things I can do is support small local suppliers for lots of different things, especially food things. Okay, there's a, a friend, I have a friend that lives up in Vermont and, and uh, the local, the, the store had run out of flour, but there was a small local flour mill that still um, had flour. So that was an example of big running out of it and little still had it. No, and, and, and local products are gonna cost more money. There's no way I can fight that trade-off. I was just talking to Trip today, and I want to commend the Trip for what he's doing tonight. I have to keep a little confidentiality, but they had a problem at a plant, and he's there. 
getting out of the office, getting on the shop floor, finding out what the problem with the employee is and dealing with it. And then one of the things we need a lot more in businesses today is the suits need to get out of the office, find out what's going on the ground. But we need to be working with the consumer to support local for lots of different things. No, it's not going to be as efficient, but it's more robust. And we got more stuff going wrong um, uh, than we've ever had right now. Storms. I lay awake at night about the power grid. I'll just leave it at that. So, so Temple, here's another one that I, that I think's really on point. How do companies move from living in the shadow to changing the industry? Protocols and standards are one thing, but how do we grow that to scale and continue to be sustainable? Okay, now you're talking, when you're saying that's very abstract, are you talking about Nyman Ranch? How do you do it? You've been doing a very good job of growing your company. No, th this is a question from somebody in the audience. So they want to know how, you know, how do these smaller companies you know, move from kind of a, a, a shadow uh, business, you know, a, a small um, alternative to something that, that can actually get traction and flourish um, in the mainstream? Well, we've got a very big flourishing craft beer industry in Fort Collins. Well, unfortunately, shutting down the bars has really hurt that industry, mm -hmm. but they were not hurt by Budweiser. One thing they've learned is you can't get too big. Then you get on Bud's radar. That starts to get uh, dangerous. But if you stay small, uh, you coexist with the big ones because you're going into niches that are too clumsy to get to go into. And then eventually, um, and we've, you, you start things. Now, one of the problems I've seen with small suppliers, and I read some very bad reviews for a, for a company that was sending out specialty boxes of meat. We'll leave their name on it because the reviews are horrible. And I know what happened to them. They got more orders than they can supply. So they started shipping out inferior product. And that's the best way to wreck your company. Another company that one, that one of my colleagues worked with was grass-fed beef. And again, they got more orders than they can supply and they started sticking grain-fed cattle in it. They were cheating. That's what you don't do. Those are two examples right there. And the thing with the boxes of meat, that's something that's going on right now. And we'll leave the name off of it. But gotcha. their reviews are horrible and they probably deserve them. So Temple, another question that came through is, are the big commodity processing plants making any changes that you know, that you know of? Well, the big one thing I can say about big commodity plants is when they work, they can have very good welfare. They can have good food safety. And then a snake crawls into their electrical system and shuts off the power supply. One of these big plants. I'm not going to tell you where the snake went, but I got a picture of fried snake shown to me on the phone. <laughs> and he really screwed up their electrical system. Yeah, it's fragile. A little black snake. It was about this long. Right. Their power completely off, made a mess out of it. Wow. Um, here's another one. Do you think we need more small capacity local meat processors, 10 to 30 head per day? And then, you know, starting up one of these is really expensive. How do business startups create a processing business for less money that can still slaughter animals? One of the ways to start up a small plant, a little one like that, is the mobile processing plant. But that mobile processing plant is going to get parked like the trailer home that never moves. But it's one of the ways to get into it cheaper because you can buy the trailer unit. You need to put a slab on it, put a slab up for it, have sewer and water hookups. Um, and then you buy several other refrigerated vehicles to store meat in. And that enables you to get into something small without costing a fortune. But some of the plants that I'm seeing right now that people are interested in, they like the 200 a day, 300 a day. They're more like the plants that coexisted with our big boys in the 70s, which was Swift, Armor, and Cudahy hmm. back in those days. Now I'm really dating myself. I'm thinking Phoenix, Arizona. We had Swift and we had Cudahy, and then we had Arizona Beef. They did 400 a day. We had Herseth Meat. They did about 300. I'm going to call these the medium-sized plants. And I actually went through our, and I added up all the, all the slaughter numbers uh, for those plants. And there was uh, Tempe Meats was another one. They came out to about a third of the supply. And so if you, let's say you lost Swift, uh, you still, and let's say we had cut of hay and the other ones left over, you still would have almost half your supply. It's more robust. Um, 
And then, then, then the thing that they got to do, these, these medium-sized plants cannot compete head-to-head -head with the big boys. That's not going to work because you have, they have economy of scale and there's no way to get around this. So one of the things that the smaller plants need to capitalize on is support local. And we need to be supporting local. And all the floods we've had, fires. Well, maybe I need to show you this picture on the phone. If you want to see something that's completely, completely creepy. Take a look at that right there. That's from my house, front of my house, <laughs> in the middle of the day. <laughs> yeah, the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Oh, I can show you another creepers like picture. I've got it right here. Uh, yeah, here's a front page of the New York Times. Here's downtown Denver. Oh, yeah. A load of that right there. Yeah, it's 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 been going to make people get a lot more serious about Agreed. supporting local, and it is going to be more expensive. Right. Yeah. So I I think it comes. But what you're talking about, Temple, is is it comes down to people making choices, and it comes if they're going to make choices, they need to be more informed. Um, you know about the choices that they're making, and you know that's part of the responsibility. I think that all of us as suppliers have. Well, you see, the, right. one of the problems up until now, I would say in the last five years, people have seen stripped shelves. Okay, I'm sorry, this picture is San Francisco, but we had similar stuff here. I just wanna correct that. Um, but we've had a lot of storms. I remember reading something where one lady said, I wasn't scared until they stripped the Walmart. <laughs> then I got scared. Right. And, we get, and we're getting more really weird storms like this weather we've had. You know, the biggest temperature fluctuation in 100 years and bad storms just ripping up stuff. Yeah, I, uh, absolutely. I think people are going to get more serious about the importance of supporting local. And it is going to cost more. That though, you can't change that. Right. Well, in, in Temple, you know, I, I think a lot of your your thought around this is it's about having a balance, right, between, That's right. between big and, and small. And we've got to make sure that, because one of the things the beer people have learned is they get, if they start selling like in 10 stores, then they get on Bud's radar. Hmm. Well, maybe this is where, you know, there's, there needs to be some antitrust stuff. Um, I'm a believer in free markets with a few rules. I remember years ago when one of the airlines in Denver, only the airline names out of it, one of the airlines owned the Denver airport. They were a vicious predator. And if this other airline did more than two trips on that route, they'd put them out of business. They were putting jumbo jets on flights like Denver to Kansas City. Well, it, it was disgusting. I, you, you, you know, there needs to be some ground rules that nobody can own more than 51% of any major market. Right. Jess, you don't, I like, my approach to, to uh, standards is fewer regulations, but the, but the few you have are critical control points and they are strict. Absolutely. So, uh, Temple, here's another good one, I think. You know, if big is fragile, can the food system provide for all levels of income without the big efficient producers that result in cheap protein? Well, and the thing is they put out cheap protein. That's the thing. And, and um, you see, this is our paradox. Big plants, when they work, when they, and I, and I worked on, on humane handling uh, with McDonald's and we cleaned up a ton of big plants. We made them really good. And after the Jack in the Box mess in the early nineties with E. coli, McDonald's went in and started cleaning the plants up. And basically what they made them do is made them manage them. And the big plants can really work really well. Right. But the problem is, is that they are fragile. They are extremely fragile. I mean, the amount of pigs that had to be euthanized, that was just a horrific nightmare. Yeah, and with uh, you know, the, the issues of food insecurity here in the US. Well, uh, there's, some real, there's some real problems with that. Yeah. And the thing is what they need to be doing now, let's say if the plants get messed up again, you gotta go big pig bits. You take that pig, you hack it up into the primal cuts, chuck it in combos. It's USDA inspected 100% pork. I can sell it off the back of the truck. This is legal. Has to be packaged. I throw it in a plastic bag. I put a zip tie on it, slap a label on it. That's legal. Right. Uh, there's places you could take that, sell it, you know. 
these are the kind of things that need to be put in place. In fact, then I found out later on that Smithfield actually was shipping pig carcasses to China. And they didn't have to destroy anywhere near as many pigs because they did big pig bits. But these are the kind of things where you got to set it up uh, beforehand. And then the labeling stuff, you're throwing milk away because you can't sell school lunch milk in a supermarket. No, right. one of the ways you can get around the antitrust is, okay, so the food service guy comes around with his truck. You know what it looks like. You know the name of it. Normally, it backs up to restaurant loading dock. You just back it up to the loading dock at the supermarket, and whatever the bills are for that food, you charge the supermarket for it. There's no price fixing. You just take whatever those bills are, those restaurants, charge the supermarket for it, sell the stuff. And that would have stopped a lot of food waste. That would have stopped the milk waste and a lot of produce waste. No, it's, a, it's a great point. You almost have got to put these things in place. So when I found out about the milk, I really went ape. There are no excuse for that. Well, and, and, you know, it kind of ties into another question that's related, which is, you know, how do you communicate between different sectors of the food system to match companies with product um, shortages while others have product surpluses? Well, you have to figure out a way to do it, a way to communicate. And that has to be done before the disaster happens. Like, okay, we've, okay, COVID was a disease. Then you might have something where a plant's flooded or something like that, um, uh, where you can divert things between sectors. I mean, restaurants is what got destroyed by COVID. Mm -hmm. And so you've got cartons of eggs you know, um, scrambled eggs in a milk carton, basically. Well, you put that in the grocery store, they don't know what to do with it. Well, you tell them it's scrambled eggs or you just use it for baking and put it in the milk case, put a sign on it, sell it. It's 100% pure egg. You see where you get into allergen issues with labeling is further processed. You know, if it's just plain egg or plain milk or plain pork, there's no allergen issue. It is what it is. Sure. But we have to figure out up front how we can, uh, where, where, how you would do this and have a communication system for doing it. You see what happens is, let's say the people working the plant don't want to throw the milk away, but the lawyers say, oh, we're going to get sued. Well, you've got to figure out how to get around that up front where you have a way, emergency way, because the amount of food that got thrown away was the most sinful thing I ever saw. I was brought up, you don't waste food. Absolutely. Um, so here's another one. You know, earlier you were talking about, um, you know, the importance of, of, you know, setting, you know, clear protocols and guidelines, putting those in place. So uh, there's a question here. How do we make people more aware of actual animal welfare versus, versus mislabeling and the feel good we read on labels? Well, first of all, what's on your label has to be the truth. And I know your labels have been good, but I've worked with another client. Um, I'll, there was some egg cartons I, I helped get rid of because they showed hens grazing on pasture, silhouettes of hens grazing on pasture. Now their eggs were cage free, but they were inside the building. I called up their supply chain management and I said, you know, those egg cartons need to go away as soon as you use them up. And they did because that's not, I don't think they did it on purpose. You know, some artist made an egg carton label look kind of pretty with uh, silhouettes of hens grazing. That's not what they had. Well, after I told them about the egg cartons, they went, they were gone in about a month. They had to use them up first. But no, that you're, you've got to, it, whatever your label is now, I've corrected this. Uh, this was San Francisco. I grabbed it too quickly. But we had a sky that looked just like that right where I lived. Sure. So Temple, I mean, how do you go about enforcing that, right? I mean, there's, you know, first, I mean, your point is suppliers have, have to be honest, right? In terms well, of- first of all, you got people like Tripp, he's not here tonight, so he can fix a mess in a plant. And I don't think I should go into the details about it. He told me all about it. But there was a mess in a plant involving some employees and he's going there to fix it. And that's what top management needs to do. Because trip being in that plant is more important than trip being on this Zoom call. You see, and that is something I really respect. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
There's not enough of the suits getting out of the office and finding out what's on the ground. I did a talk at a sustainability meeting and I heard a lot of VPs of sustainability for big major corporations talk a lot of abstractions, but it was all completely abstract. And then I went to a session on, uh, on uh, debris in the ocean. And you know what I found out? I found out I knew more about it than half the other people at this little conference. Hmm. And I'm going, well, they think about it very abstractly. Okay, well, what con constitutes debris? There's a lot of fishing gear that's gotten loose. Well, that's low hanging fruit. Let's go after that. But you see, it, I'm a visual thinker, so I see it. Well, we get tracked down where that fishing gear is coming from and start working with the fishing industry, not let the stuff get loose and let, let it end up in the garbage patch and wrapped up around all kinds of marine animals. Right. That's something, um, but they were talking about sustainability and a total abstraction. I'm used to going out into the field and getting things done. When I did the McDonald's audits, we had five simple things we measured. And I was not out there shoving equipment down the plant's throats. And most of them, what they had to do is manage their employees, put some non flooring in, take hot shots out of people's hands, repair some stuff. And most of the plants don't work fine when they started managing them and measuring. You've got to measure welfare indicators like lameness, for example, cell body condition. Those are things that you have to measure because if you don't measure them, it's just like the speeding out on the highway they'll start to go bad on you. You manage the stuff that you measure. Absolutely. Um, you know, kind of on the similar theme here, there's a, a question, you know, it's been nearly impossible to get hogs or cattle booked into a small processor. How do small farmers who work through these systems work through these challenges? Well, this is a big problem. That's why we need more small plants. Mm -hmm. And what's happening with a lot of hands-on things is, um, the small plant people are retiring. And uh, this, some of this goes back to taking skilled trades out of the schools. I'm working on a new book now on the importance of visual thinking. We don't have people to fix things. And a lot of the people that I worked with on building some of the big projects I was involved in, I'd say 20% of them would be special ed kids today, autistic, dyslexic, ADHD. And, and they, some of these people, they'd be great at running a small plant but they're ending up, they fail algebra, so they can't graduate from high school. I never passed an algebra course. I managed to figure out how to get out of it. And a lot of stuff I did, I went in the back door, but um, we need to expose young people to farming. One of the ways to get more people doing things, get young people involved. And we've got to make sure the schools don't take out the FFA programs. Absolutely, we've got to keep those. They also teach uh, kids public speaking and they teach um, a lot of other good skills. They teach skills like welding. Uh, but we're, we're, I was reading today again about this fire on about an 80 year old man driving a bulldozer to make the fire line. And he unfortunately was died. He got incinerated in this bulldozer. And that the people that were really good at making the fire lines with the bulldozers, one guy was 68 and the other guy was in in his 80s and he died on, on the fire line. I just read that today. You know, we need more people in some of these very high-end skilled trades. People that can build a small plant. Right now, great big poultry processing plant, beautiful one. It came from Holland in a hundred shipping containers. Wow. We don't know how to build it anymore. And it goes back to taking out the skilled trades 25 years ago. We're paying for that, not right now. And we're finally realizing we need to be putting these things back in. We're importing that equipment from a high wage country. Not, I'm not talking about cheap clothing from China. Okay, well, here's some little scarf thing I got, came from China. That's uh, uh, cheap stuff. I'm talking, there's a high wage and it, we're not starting the little shops that would grow into the big shops that'd be making this stuff. And the few people we have left that are in the US making these specialized equipment, they're old, they're my age. I'm 73 now. Right. Yeah, you know, Temple, it, it is amazing. Um, you know, we, we gave out some scholarship awards last night to uh, the, the kids of some of our farmers. And uh, Ty Schmidt is the name of the, uh, you know, one of the, one of the kids who, who won our sustainability award. And I was going through his application. And in his application, 
you know, he played lots of sports, four years on Future Farmers of America, and he was working three separate jobs, um, heavy equipment on the farm. He was working for a drainage company, and then he was uh, doing work, uh, you know, uh, laying concrete and had been doing that for, you know, for two years. And that's all while he's, you know, going through school and pursuing all of his interests. So your, your point around, you know, the trades and the importance of them, I, I think, is really highlighted. And the one place we see it, I think, is, is you know, within kind of rural America. Well, and who's going to fix broken electrical equipment when the storms have wrecked it? Right. And then all that mess with the power lines in California, they never maintain any of that stuff. I went out to California just before COVID, and if the wind blows more than 40 miles an hour in this rural area, they got to turn the power off because the wires are going to fall off the big towers because they never maintain anything. Right. That's ridiculous. It is. And, and we've got too much in this country where, where the finance people are just kind of, you know, want to suck the blood out of everything. You can tell me I'm not a gigantic fan of the finance sector. <laughs> no. So, so Temple, here's... I like, I like people that do stuff. Right. Agreed. So, so here, here's another, another good, good one. Um, is Temple concerned about humane animal treatment in small plants? Absolutely. And small plants, uh, my friend Erica Vogue, uh, she does consulting in small plants. And a lot of the problems in small plants is lack of knowledge. Uh, they, uh, you can have really good humane handling in small plants, but you have to be taught that, uh, like with electric stunning, you've got to place the stunner correctly. The biggest problem with captive bolts is people don't maintain the equipment. You have to take that gun apart every day. You got to treat it like the finest hunting rifle. You can't let it get wet. Um, then you're going to have good stunning. You see, and and that's attention to attention to detail. Yes, you can have very humane handling at small plants, and I'm just and you can you can have big is bad, and you can have big is nice. When it comes to humane handling, you can have small that's really nice and small that's bad. When it comes to humane handling and animal welfare, you can have there's really high standards, neither small or in big. And it basically gets back to the management. I'm impressed that Trip went out to that plant tonight, in the last minute to deal with the problem there. And we need more management that does that kind of stuff. You now he's to be commended for that. Because his being in that plant right now, talking to those employees is more important than him introducing me right now. And, and you're stuck with me. <laughs> no, but that's fine. But I'm, I'm, I, when I talked to Trip out, he told me exactly what the problem was. Oh yeah. But it was, uh, it's something where top management need to deal with it. Yeah, and he's dealing with it, and that's more important than this meeting tonight was. That, absolutely, you can't, you can't beat. You know, I spent time working in 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 a plant, and the thing that always made the biggest difference for me when I was having an issue was when you know, senior management would come down and spend some time as I'm explaining to them the challenges that we're facing. And they're talking to me about how that's translating and showing up in the marketplace by being on the plant floor. You know, that understanding is there. And as, and as a, somebody working in a plant, you know, I knew that they cared enough, you know, to take the time, you know, to get down there and, and, and yeah, hear what I had to say. Those people working in the plants, because I spent 25 years in construction. I would sell a job, then I'd dry it up, then I'd supervise construction, and then we start that piece of equipment up. I mean, I was the I developed the center track restrainer for big meat packing plants. Right. And I got that piece of equipment developed and I worked in all these plants. I worked with the best managers, I worked with the worst managers on that. All and and the people on the ground, they when top management takes an interest in them, it makes a big impression on them. It is the right thing to do. Absolutely. So Temple, you know, a question that came came in is how do consumers hold companies accountable? Well, one of the things is is I, the, there's been companies where there's been very nasty videos of treatment of animals that uh, really hurt their bottom line. Some people stopped buying some of the products. That happened. And, and uh, the, there's been a huge uh, growth of auditing. I worked on starting some of the initial audits, and that's over 20 years ago now with McDonald's. They were the pioneer on starting animal welfare audits, and they didn't publicize it at all. Their publicity about it was atrocious. You know, you're doing good things, 
you need to be explaining it. And you might want to look at a book called The Battle to Do Good by Bob Langer. That's the person I worked with at McDonald's, The Battle to Do Good. And while we're discussing books, I got to show my new slaughter book off right here, The Slaughter of Farm Animals, Practical Ways of Enhancing Welfare. And uh, it explains things like how to do electric stunning correctly because a lot of little plants have lack of knowledge. And yes, you can do it. You can have very high standards in small plants and you don't have to spend a fortune. Right. And one thing Eric has worked with is she's worked with them on making their HACCP plans for food safety. And you can have a good HACCP plan that's not a binder stuff that thick. So Temple, I, I think we're, we're, we're running out of time. So we'll do one or two more questions. So one that came in is, you know, with disposable income dec decreasing, are you concerned for specialty meat brands like Nyman? Well, I think there's always going to be people that are going to be buying uh, specialty breed, uh, specialty brands. Where where we really getting problems with food insecurity is, is low income folks. We've got some real uh, problems there. I uh, you know there's a lot of problems out there, and one of the problems we got now is everything's turning into rhetoric rather than how do we actually solve problems on the ground. Okay. And, you know, and just from a from a Nyman perspective, um, you know, consumers are spending less money today out in out in restaurants. They're still seeking special occasions. Oh, um, absolutely, and and people want to eat in restaurants. Like the restaurants around here where I live, they're they're putting outdoor things up. They're already talking about how they're going to maybe put a tent up. Now they can't enclose that tent too much, or they're going to start getting that airborne COVID. Uh, but putting a bunch of heaters around and I'm, I've got one restaurant now, I think safe to go to. I, I walk in, I get the food at the counter and they've got nice outdoor tables. I've been eating over there um, like twice since COVID. I've eat, eaten in a restaurant. Everything else has been takeout and, and, um, uh, and just doing stuff at home. Yeah, absolutely. So look, there, there's a lot more questions that, that we have not gotten to. Well, the industry is hurting worse than food is clothing. I haven't bought any clothing since COVID. Mm -hmm. Clothing sales have just tanked. Right. And then right now, why is there a glut of oil in, in the world? Because people aren't driving. The airplanes aren't flying. So now we've got the weird situation here in Germany of what to do with this oil refinery. And I look at this and I'd be... I don't want to wreck this plan. I want to keep it because there's just so much stuff going on right now that I don't want to lose that supply. And it's going to be more expensive to get it out of that oil refinery. Sure. But it's a distributed supply chain. But you see, you get somebody strictly a financial person, they're going to say, well, we need to just tear, we need to just get rid of this oil refinery. But you see, I'm seeing there's a big pipeline that comes in. What if that stops? Right. What if, what if um, I, you see, this is the problem. This is the paradox. Big when it works, works beautifully. It's cheap. They can have excellent animal welfare in a big plant. They can have excellent food safety in a big plant. Let's just run right. But it can break very, very easily. Right. That's the problem. That's the paradox. And the distributed supply chain is going to be more expensive. And there's nothing I can do to change that. But when things go wrong, it's more robust. It's that simple. And you've got the thing with pharmaceuticals too. Well, the guy with the, with the infected foot that I know, he would have been in a lot of trouble if he couldn't have gotten those antibiotics. This is somebody I know. It's a friend of mine. The bad infected foot. Yeah, I mean, Temple, I, I think the way you, you, you positioned it a minute ago about, you know, there's, there's two different models. They both have a role to play. They both have a role to play. We yeah. need both. They, first of all, they need to stop throwing rocks at each other. That's one of the things they need to stop doing. There is a place for both. And then, and then there were some bad things. I remember I worked on a project back in New York. This was years ago in the 80s. And um, another big plant bought the little tiny plant just to get rid of it. Well, we're going to have to prevent some of that stuff. Yeah. 
uh, because that it's just too fragile and we've been seeing it. A snake, think about it, a black snake, he's this long. He shut an entire big plant down. Right. The whole thing. Well, Temple, I, I think that's a great way to, 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 to tie things together. Um, you know, and, and just for everybody on, you know, who's joined us tonight, you know, a few comments, you know, the, the challenge for everybody here is what do we do now? Right. Well, one of the things is be very good at what you do. And you've got top management that's doing what they're supposed to be doing tonight, going out to a plant, missing this meeting, going to a plant to fix a problem on that shop floor. Absolutely. And you need to keep doing that. And sometimes big forgets to do that, especially if the financial people totally get a hold of it too much. We need a lot more operations people and control and stuff. Do a really good job of what you do. Make sure that what's on your label, you actually do it. Because there's been companies that um, were doing some really good things and they had one lapse, totally wrecked the sale of their product. No, there's some videos out there. They've, they've ruined the sale of a lot of product. Absolutely. You know, I mean, Temple, you know, COVID is essentially a, you know, a black swan. It's, it's a big, big disruption. And, you know, most disruptions provide... Um, they present significant opportunity, right? And COVID is certainly well, no exception. One of the things it's done is it's been a wake-up call for consumers to see shelves stripped. Okay, I just went in the grocery store the other day and my favorite brand of sausage wasn't there. No, well, it was mine and I bought a different one, but there was food on the shelves. And this was a little teeny thing. But I remember going in and, and the entire paper products aisle was stripped. See, the problem you got with paper products is it's just in time processing because it's so expensive to ship and store. Well, the other thing that people are, are stopping doing is it's just in time processing. Well, and, and again, it comes back to there's there, there's two systems. They both have a role. They need to work they together. Two systems and they need to coexist. Yep. They need to coexist because um, we actually need both because we've got a lot of uh, low income folks. They need to buy that cheap product. They need, the systems need to coexist. And we need to also be working on contingency plans when things do go wrong. What are some other ways where they could divert those pigs? Like maybe have a competition plant slaughter them. So we're not throwing them away. Well, look, if well, we the milk doesn't get thrown away because we're seen to be having more storms. I've been around for a lot of years. We got more worse storms than we've ever had. Yeah, I, I think if as an industry we haven't made progress, you know, from the spring to now, you know, sh you know, shame on shame on us collectively. But uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty optimistic. You know, I, I think, like I said, COVID's. You know, it's presented. It's it's a challenge, but it's also a pretty unique opportunity. Well, it's also shown how fragile some of this stuff is, mm -hmm. and and I think we're going to get a bigger problem with the separation between the haves and the have-nots. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I think there's going to be plenty of people around to buy Nyman, i um, and we need the big plants. Mm -hmm. But they also are recognizing just how fragile it is. I mean, Tyson put out, got a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal that the supply chain was broken. Right. I came out full page ad in the New York Times. Yeah, I mean, I, Temple, I think bottom line is consumers, they're going to be paying more attention um, to what they're what they're buying. They're going to be asking more questions. They've got more access to information than they ever had before. You've got channels like direct to consumer where you can actually tell the story in a way that you just can't do it on a package. That's right. That's right. And the other thing is the other thing I think it's made a lot of people think I haven't bought any clothing. I remember reading, a, reading an article about a lady. She happened to be over in China and she was locked up, you know, the really strict lockdown. And she had like six fancy purses. And she looked at these fancy purses and realized how stupid they were. Why do you need six ridiculously expensive purses? You don't. And she's locked up in her apartment. I think it's also made people think about what stuff you actually need. Well, you don't need six expensive purses. And she realized that. Right. But it was after she got locked up in her apartment that she, uh, during a COVID quarantine that she realized that. Right. All right. Well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to close this out. Just a couple quick comments. You know, and I just want to say this, you know, I, I'm, I feel really fortunate in that, 
you know, I stepped into Nyman Ranch and when I did, I inherited, you know, a, a very stable, a very resilient business, you know, built by a, a, a dedicated group of leaders before me, you know, as, as you can tell with, uh, you know, with what uh, Temple has shared about Trip and where he is tonight. That's right. Um, you know, but what's important and what's never been lost on me is this stability and resiliency was not always the case for Nyman Ranch, right? Not too long ago, Nyman Ranch was having trouble making payroll. You know, its ideas you know, were, were viewed as crazy, unrealistic by many. And, you know, Temple, the, the turnaround happened because of partners like you. you know, well, who, who I remember years ago when Nyman, when um, Coleman Natural Beef started, years and years ago, now, a lot of people in the big cattle industry that thought Coleman was horrible. Ten mm-hmm. years later, ranchers were lining up to get in that program. Yeah, I, th- I think you want to be hated. The thing is, we need to get, we need our family ranchers, because when you do ranching right, you can improve land. You do ranching wrong, you wreck land. I'm getting more interested in how we can integrate livestock, pigs, cattle, all kinds of livestock into crop rotation programs, and you do it right, you can use animals to improve land. Absolutely. And you see, monoculture, think about monoculture and crops. Well, monoculture in the industry isn't good either. Well, you know, Temple, I, I, you know, I hope you know this, and, you know, the impact, you know, that you're, um, you know, working with, uh, with Trip and the leadership team that, that came before me, you know, today we have 770 family farmers and ranchers as part of the network. And, you know, that, that was made possible by, you know, by the help provided by you and a number of other partners. Um, you know, and I, I often wonder what would have happened, you know, to Nyman if, if folks like you hadn't stepped in, you know, when Nyman asked for help, if you'd come back and you said, I just don't have time. And, well, and you didn't. And we, well, we really I, appreciate I'm that. I'm really interested in how do we do things to make things work on the ground. One of the things I worked very hard with, and I did this with a bunch of clients, big and small, clear guidelines. I'm the one who wrote what's now the NAMI um, the animal welfare scoring system, uh, the NAMI guidelines. I wrote that and you use it for big or small. And you measure stunning because if you measure how many pigs you stun correctly, then if you start getting sloppy, you'll, your numbers will go down. You do a better job, your numbers go up. You manage what you measure. That's true for big and small. And you also have to have real clear guidelines. You have clear guidelines about your housing and you have to make sure that doing what you say you're doing. Absolutely. You know, look, I, I think at the end of the day, moving forward here, um, you know, it's going to be about investing in farmers, you know, and a willingness to pay a fair price. You know, that, that starts with us, you know, and, and extends to consumers, right? It's, it's that connection, yeah. um, you know, from farm to fork, understanding what it takes to get, you know, from a farm all the way through the system and onto somebody's plate, whether it's in a restaurant or at their house. You know, I think it's about all of us, you know, working to, together to make sure no corners are cut, you know, and that animals are treated with respect. I mean, this is this is something that, you know, you, you've you really made your mark on Temple. And, you know, I think everybody who's joined us here tonight, you know, thanks you for that. Um, you know, and bottom line is if we want to build out alternatives to the industrial food system and it's an alternative, it's not a replacement. You no, know, they, it, they it's, together. it's just like our beer industry. Yeah. The, these two things have to coexist in these bigger plants that they're, you know, I'm going to call them the medium sizes because they're talking about 400 cattle a day, 500 a day, 200 cattle a day. That's not a locker plant. Um, one of the niches they'll be in is local. And, and uh, they're probably going to be more expensive. And then they can do some specialty kind of cattle and things like that. Um, but I think that um, people are you know, going to get more interested in supporting local and they've seen COVID make a mess out of things. Storms make a mess out of things. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We all need to do our small part. You know, Temple, you've had a massive impact on, on the industry, on animal welfare. You know, for Nyman, you know, we can't fix the issues of, you know, rural decay, but, but we can do our part every time we bring a farmer on board. That's right. But you see, you're fixing it one farmer at a time. Yep. And I've tell a lot of young people they want to get in and change the whole world. I said, when I started my business, that was back in the seventies, I worked one little ranch project at a time. I remember going to little tiny projects. When I first started 
and making sure that rancher was satisfied with the, thing I, with the corrals I had designed. One small project at a time. Another thing that I did that really helped my career is I wrote about it. I wrote about the things and I ex told, explained how to design them, how to build them. Some people just say, why do you give it away? I said, well, I always get plenty of consulting. So yep. it's um, okay to give it away. And I just explained to people how to you know, handle cattle, how to build things. Uh, but writing about stuff is also really important. Writing was a very important part of my career. And one problem I'm seeing now with a lot of younger students, some of the writing skills are just off. I, and they're not being taught grammar and, and oh. learn how to write a book report and learn how to summarize things. So one of the big things, I'm, I'm, my next book is going to be about uh, education is affecting things like skilled trades. We don't know how to build a poultry processing plant anymore. I think that's a big problem. Well, a lot, a lot has to change. And you know, Temple, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just close it out. I want to thank everybody who joined us tonight. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to join. Um, it's been great, Temple, to listen to you, and you know, and sharing your expertise, you know, on on these topics. So thank you for everything you've done. Thanks for taking the time tonight. And for everybody out there, have a great evening. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was really great to be here, at least uh, virtually tonight. Okay. Thanks, Temple. Okay. I guess we sign off.